Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Prof. Wong, uh, Joe, and all my respected uh, uh, participants here uh, in the workshop today. So, um, this is actually the, the topic that I'm going to share with you. Prof. Fong asked me to talk about the big picture on OER in Malaysia and what are some of the challenges and the prospect uh, to move uh, forward. It's been a long time um, I talk about OER because um, I remember uh, back in 2012, there was a lot of discussion. In fact, I was uh, involved um, in the focus group during the formulation of the first OER declaration. It was Paris 2012. I was involved in the group, uh, the Asia Pacific group. So we had our a few discussion. Uh, the last one was in Bangkok, UNESCO Bangkok. And I was there in Paris for the OER Paris declaration. But I didn't have the chance to go to the Slovenia, right? For the second declaration. But I'm glad that we are here today because um, since 2012, the Paris Declaration, uh, as we saw in, in Philippines, uh, there's not much has been, I mean, in terms of progress, in terms of the implementation of those, uh, I remember 12 original OER Paris, Paris OER Declaration. So how do we integrate that uh, in a bigger uh, framework? Especially now, uh, my presentation, uh, this morning, I want to see how we put uh, the OER in the context of the bigger so-called flexible education uh, in, in Malaysia and how do we move uh, forward. Okay, so basically these are the things that uh, I hope I can cover hmm? okay. during this uh, short uh, presentation. Um, I want to kind of backtrack a little bit because uh, Profong have made some assumptions that all the participants here really understand and appreciate what is OER. Um, but I don't want to take for granted, so I just want to uh, cover very briefly the why behind it. Otherwise, uh, I believe in anything we do, we must understand the why and then only the what and uh, the how, the details. Mm -hmm. Uh, then, what are the uh, factors that really drives uh, OER? And these are the things that I think we need to understand because when we uh, discuss on our, on our uh, uh, national policy, these are the factors that we need to take into account when we put in the policy statement and, and so on. Then, uh, putting OER in the bigger context, in the flexible education context that in Malaysia now, uh, since the uh, even from the previous uh, government or previous minister, uh, we've been pu we've been pushing actually flexible education, and we we put that as one of the main agenda. And what are the different components? And one one of them is actually uh, in terms of content, which is the OER. Then the challenges. Uh, I, I don't like to actually spend too much time on challenges because when we put think about challenges, we put you know uh, roadblocks. But somehow we need to be realistic and you know how do we address those in the policy. And then uh, OER uh, in Malaysia way forward. Okay? Now, uh, I'd like to give, uh, I mean, I'd like to mention this and give a credit. Uh, this actually, the initiative, initially, previously, I think a few years ago, maybe two years ago, uh, taken by a group led by Prof. Uh, Rosan. Yeah? Prof. Rosan? Ah, kat belakang sana, eh? So, he has actually taken the initial initiative to put a group together and come up with this, came up with this document towards national policy guidelines on open educational resources in Malaysia. And I think that's a good uh, initiative, Prof, because although, again, not much has been done during, you know, since then, but I think we are now here and actually uh, we can use some of the ideas uh, in, this, in this document to help us to refine our national policy. All right, um, the philosophy and the motivation, this is the why. I think we need to really understand and be very clear and appreciate uh, in order to really um, 
make OER really happens in Malaysia and, and also around the world. Well, this picture, I really like this picture. This was the original slide when I first talked about OER many, many years ago, even before you know, the Paris Declaration. Uh, because this picture is in Malaysia, in Malaysia. Uh, you can see uh, how determined they are to get education. So we, we talk about the accessibility, the availability of education and, and so on. So it seems that uh, even now, access to education in any form is still a challenge in many parts of the world. So our challenge is how to make the, bring education to them, how to make education available to them. And of course, the United Nations through UNESCO has been the champion uh, of uh, education for all. And now, uh, as part of SDG, Sustainable Development Goal 4, number 4, to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities uh, for all, including uh, the inclus uh, inclusiveness or inclusivity. And of course, um, Malaysia, it's not far behind. Um, we have our Malaysian Education Blueprint. This one is for the higher education, where we have the five aspirations there to address and to support, in fact, uh, SDG. So the access, issue of quality, equity, unity, and efficiency. So what are actually uh, factors that really drives OER? First, I think, is the change in philosophy. Okay? Uh, I think many, many years ago, uh, the, the concept or the spirit of sharing is caring, maybe not, not so widespread. But now, I think we are always ever willing to share. So that has changed in terms of the philosophy. And now we, we actually view uh, knowledge not uh, as a collective social product and the desirability of making it a social property rather than, you know, uh, we are trying to keep it to our own. Okay? So that's uh, the change in, in, in philosophy, which uh, learning is sharing and is caring. Okay? So that's the, the good thing, I guess. And uh, I have, as I, as I, uh, I, I can say that I'm a very strong advocate of OER and open education in general, online education, and so on. So uh, I have actually written quite a bit on this aspect. You can read in some of my articles in newspaper and also a uh, presentation on this one. So this is one of actually slides you can find on the internet. If you just Google my name, open education resources, you can find this and you can download. So it's all about the philosophy again here that I want to reiterate is about uh, reaching out to global learners and deliver education uh, for all. Uh, just like this picture here, the, the dandelion uh, flower, you know, uh, when the wind blow and spread the seeds, just like we spread our knowledge, uh, 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 accessible to everyone uh, globally. Now, the, this, this, so the first factor just now was a change in philosophy people are now ever willing to share. The second one is actually, of course, the enabler that will support OER is the ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous technology in terms of the internet, the hyper-connectivity, and the affordable uh, mobile devices. And this is actually the, the uh, data from uh, statistics from digital 2019. Uh, and you can see uh, very clearly, clearly there uh, the, the internet uh, the total population there, uh, and then the internet penetration is now is about 57% uh, globally. But in terms of digital growth, you can see that uh, the internet uh, uses uh, about 9.1% growth every year. So when we talk about uh, how technology can help us to uh, promote OER and support OER, of course there is still uh, some digital divide. There's a a lot of discussion on that digital divide, the technology divide, and so on. But I think it's closing uh, very, very fast. And this is the, the, the data on the internet penetration. Uh, as we can see here, different continent. Um, again, um, we, we would expect like those in the developed countries, the internet, the internet penetration is, is higher than the less developed or developing countries. But again, this is closing. 
So I think we don't have to wait until we are fully wired, but I think we can start the initiative in terms of uh, OER uh, from now. Um, of course, for Malaysia, you can see there, um, we have about 32 million, and in terms of the internet user and the internet penetration is about 80%. I remember about two years ago, it was about 70%, and now it's 80%. So within the period of like two years, 10% uh, uh, increase of growth. So I think that's a good sign, and soon I think it will be uh, uh, much higher. So um, I don't want to say much about uh, how the technology really, you know, uh, changing exponentially, and this is how we can leverage uh, technology to support OER. But uh, again, there's a lot of uh, disruptive technology around us, and uh, the way people learn now, you know, uh, is through learning on demand. They can have access to the material from the internet 24-7. So learning can happen now just in time, just enough and very personalized just for me. And the third factor that really uh, kind of push uh, OER is uh, the so-called alternative uh, copyright. This is actually a big thing. Uh, just now we, we, we uh, listen that uh, you know, people can download a lot of things from, from the internet, but the thing that we still, a lot of people still actually very concerned or very worried is about the copyright issue, right? And this is where the OER and the alternative copyright uh, would really uh, help in terms of uh, how now we can license the OER material in such a way that people can use it uh, freely without much concern about infringing the copyright. So this is where the Creative Commons uh, comes in. So it's actually the world is now moving from so-called all rights reserve, okay, on the right there, uh, copyright, exclusive right, moving to the other extreme here is of course public domain. In fact, I always tell people nowadays when you create any material, whether you go for the Creative Commons, which is the OER thing, or you go to public domain, okay. But again, uh, as I, I will uh, say something, uh, oops, uh, something I press. Oops. Yeah. All right. There's a conflict, and that can be an issue, and uh, that we need to address when we talk about developing OER. When we develop uh, any content or learning content, now you have a choice whether you want to you know, register or for, for the exclusive right, the copyright, or you want to go for public domain or creative common. So the, the choice now is between uh, this, this three things and uh, sometimes that can be uh, a difficult choice for, for someone, okay? So uh, this is what we are now uh, in order to promote OER. Uh, this is what we encourage uh, educators to go for which is a creative uh, common, some rights reserve, in order to qualify uh, as OER. And um, OER itself, I think, uh, is kind of uh, uh, developing or evolve together with uh, things like open courseware, the MIT and so on. Uh, this morning, you mentioned that, and also MOOC. And in the 2012, if, if you remember, MOOC is actually at the, at the highest uh, kind of, um, it was in the news uh, in 2012, but around about the same time, OER also uh, come up with the Paris OER declaration. So it's kind of, uh, you know, going um, hand in hand uh, together. And of course, uh, this is not a standard definition uh, from UNESCO, but it captures some of the, of the essence of what OERs are. Uh, educational materials, uh, usually in a digital form, but it doesn't have to, not necessarily, that are shared freely and openly. I think that's the key word for anyone to use and under some type of license to repurpose, remix, improve, and redistribute. So the essence of OER in terms of the content itself is the so-called of the 4R, uh, you know, uh, the rights. So instead of exclusive right, the C, the copyright, moving into the sum rights reserve, the CC. So these are the four R, the basic essence of uh, the, the OER. Revise, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute, and this is where we can apply 
uh, there are six different types of Creative Commons uh, license. So the bottom line about OER, the spirit or the philosophy of OER is about uh, you know, giving out the, 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 the content uh, to be accessible freely and openly and therefore to empower learners to assemble their own personal ecologies to support their individual learning pathway. Uh, in terms of the bigger picture, the flexible education in, in Malaysia, in order to support uh, or create an ecosystem of that flexible education, where does OER comes in? So, um, ah, this is actually the, the slide from last week, keynote by our, my Vice Chancellor, Dr. Asma. Uh, we can have this. We can actually make this whole presentation available in our apa tu? sharing platform. Though okay. uh, it's quite big, about 200 megabyte, because uh, the graphic is quite heavy. But if you uh, if you are interested, you can download. I will make it available to the secretariat. But I just take a few slides from here, uh, from the Asma, with her permission, of course. Uh, she was talking about imaginary 21st century learning. So a lot of things there, but actually, um, if you see, oh, that the slides come later. I will skip this one. Uh, but actually, she was the, the gist of it. She was talking about how we can create the flexible education, and therefore we can also create a so-called new culture of learning. People learn very different way nowadays because of the uh, accessibility availability of uh, technology. And uh, this is basically, um, in general, what does it mean by flexible education? It's a set of educational philosophies and system concerned with providing learners with increased choice, convenience, and personalization to suit their particular learning needs. It supports policy for improved learning and widening participation, which lead to knowledge-based society and economic workers. And basically, uh, this slide captures so-called, uh, if like, the, the, the whole ecosystem, the enablers, the components that would support the flexible education. And I just want to draw your, the attention here to this one. In, because uh, we can see here, okay, starting from access, and in fact, I was uh, uh, in, in uh, Paris, I think, uh, last month, in, in, yeah. uh, I joined another group, of UNESCO, uh, that group is actually looking at um, coming, uh, looking at the, the flexible pathway into higher education. So actually, mainly about accessibility. Then uh, we have uh, here the recognition of prior learning. So recognition of prior learning, especially relevant when we look at the the other uh, group, which is the so-called non-traditional students which actually the bigger group compared to the formal traditional students in the formal uh, educational institution. In the US, it's about 75%. In Malaysia, I'm not sure the figure, but probably also a big number. Because those that really have access to the formal education through our UPU and, and so on is only a small fraction. So how do we cater those non-traditional students? So this is where we uh, have something called recognition of prior learning. And I was uh, quite surprised and maybe proud when we presented the um, different case uh, countries, uh, because there were seven countries represent different continents in this meeting in UNESCO, Paris. And Malaysia actually is very well, um, I mean, quite uh, advanced in terms of uh, ahead very well ahead in terms of supporting this flexible education, in terms of the flexible pathway and so on. But uh, our focus today and what we are discuss will be discussing today is here, the, the content and the curriculum. So this is where the OER comes in, in the whole of this uh, flexible uh, education ecosystem. Of course, the delivery, the teaching and learning met methods, assessment and the recognition here. And you can see here the micro-credential here, the blockchain, uh, e-learning, MOOCs, ODL, and, and so on. These are this should come together uh, in in a way that they can be integrated uh, seamlessly. Yeah. 
So uh, as far as higher education scenario in, in Malaysia is, is concerned, uh, I think Joe might want to know this. We have 20 public universities, uh, 34 polytechnics, 21 community colleges, about 500 private universities and, and colleges. And when we look at the whole uh, kind of the, the main players uh, of education uh, in, in Malaysia, of course we have school uh, and also the Institute, Institute of Higher Learnings. Um, at the ministry level, the Ministry of Education, now we are one. We used to be two, then one, then two, then one. I mean, two different ministries, then merge and, and so on. So uh, we have a national uh, policy in the form of, uh, we, we have also Malaysia Education Blueprint for education and school. We have a national uh, policy for uh, e-learning uh, and MQA, also a Malaysian Qualification Agency. They have uh, come out with uh, more credit transfer, APL, A and APL C. This is where uh, the kind of the instrument to allow flexible um, pathway to enter higher education. And recently, we have micro credential guideline. This is still work in progress. And school, and as far as school is concerned, um, at the school level, uh, we used to have the LMS uh, in the form of Frog VLE, but they are now moving into Google Classroom. I heard. In terms of capacity building, as far as technology is concerned, they have the Bahagian Technology Pendidikan, uh, Educational Technology Division. Eh? Yeah. But I'm not sure about the OER things, OER initiative in school, how much is being done, or you know, uh, whether they are doing, looking something at the school level. Maybe we have friends here that can share. And I'm not sure whether they have a repository, repo, national repository or not. Uh, for the universities, um, polytechnic and co community colleges, as far as the OER policies uh, are concerned, uh, I think uh, we have many universities now have their own institutional policy. I think about 70% of our public universities have their own uh, OER policy. Although at the national level, we don't have uh, OER policy. So it's kind of um, uh, some universities. So sorry, I, I'm, I'm not talking about OER. I'm talking here about e learning policy here, but not OER policy. Sorry. And of course, in terms of learning management system, uh, mainly we use open source like Moodle. Then, in terms of capacity building, I think it's quite good. As far as public universities are concerned, almost all 20 public universities have some, have uh, their own teaching and learning center that also uh, carry out trainings for their staff. OER repository, uh, I think this one also uh, many public universities have their own uh, OER repository. So we are doing OER in, in some form, but maybe not in a very uh, systematic or concerted way. Uh, this is our blueprint, and uh, here in our blueprint, uh, shift number nine on globalized online learning, this is where I think we can, at the national level, we can drive the OER agenda. We can drive the OER, thank you. We can drive the OER uh, agenda uh, using this as one of the enablers, uh, not enablers, but as one of the kind of uh, um, part of the part of the bigger uh, flexible education framework that we can use to push the implementation of uh, OER. So shift number nine, um, I think is one of the uh, part of the flexible education that we can uh, we can use to push for the OER. And of course, we we also have this um, national e-learning policy. Now is in version two, okay. And this is actually a very good effort since uh, many years ago. Um, basically, we can see here the main um, thrust of this national e-learning policy. Uh, we have infrastructure here, curriculum, e-content, enculturation, professional development, and organizational structure. But the OER probably can you know, come under this uh, part. Um, I think OER, in terms of content, is very closely related to the uh, e-learning. So you can see here, 70% uh, of our public 
universities especially, they already have some form of e-learning policy. And 98%, almost all, uh, have their own e-learning unit or center. And this is, I guess, this is where they can play a role to support the development <coughs> and uh, utilization of OER. And 100%, all of the public universities have their own learning man management system. So, in terms of the infrastructure on the ecosystem and uh, the enablers, um, I think we, we have some form of um, uh, support already available to push OER to the next level. Uh, in terms of national policy, this slide is from, <laughs> from Prof. Noazia. Uh, I just put it here just now. Uh, we do have uh, different kind of uh, policies here. Uh, for example, uh, we have the inclusive education, uh, the zero reject policy, inclusive higher education, uh, including the one that you know, we, we, we'll be discussing today to put in our national policy for OER, the UDL, and uh, another one here is employment for uh, PWD, person, person with, with disabilities. Yeah? But again, I think the, the, the challenge for us uh, is how to put them together in the bigger, uh, all-encompassing uh, kind of framework. The challenges, well, this is actually the, the studies I just go through very quickly. I take from uh, this work by, from Open Wawasa University. Uh, they, look, they, they did some uh, survey, and these are the, the, some of the findings, the type of digital resources that are being used, uh, the type of maybe you know, OER that is being used, uh, in, in, uh, in their course, in their teaching and learning, digital readers, online class discussion, images, visual material, online digitis, digitized documents, digital film or video, and, and so on. And these are some more. As you can see there, e-book is there. Uh, animations, especially for sciences and engineering and so on, I think very useful. And can be very expensive to, to develop. So imagine now, someone or a group develop very expensive animation, now they have to decide whether they want to apply a copyright, which nowadays, especially for public university, is very valuable because of the IP. Because <laughs> they, they always think that, okay, one IP, that when they apply for the copyright, is, is equivalent to one IP from the pattern. So either they want to go for the copyright or they want to go for the OER. But if they go for the OER, currently there's not much incentive in for the, from the university. These are the things that we need to consider, you know, in the, in the policy. Um, use of digital resources, so these are the various ways how our uh, teachers and our, our lecturers are using the uh, OER or digital resources in their teaching and learning. Production of OER, as you can see, um, okay, we currently do not produce open education resources as full courses or program about 11% as part of courses, 37% as learning object, about 26%. I think we, uh, in Malaysia, I think we are still uh, consumers rather than producers of OER, okay? Because uh, the, the ecosystem is not there, maybe the support is not there, uh, maybe, and also the, the, the uh, recognition. Um, Okay, concerns about producing OER. I think these are, some of these are real, uh, real issues of concern. In terms of, uh, you know, when, when we ask our teacher, for example, and our lecturers to produce, we train them to produce their OER, and it can be very time consuming. So naturally, some of them will ask, you know, what's in it for me, in terms of the incentive, recognition, and, and so on. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, the concern is my time, criticism from students, skepticism over usefulness, fear over copyright. Uh, this is a real concern, actually. That's why uh, in USM, in uh, my university, we, we have this workshop. Every semester we offer this workshop because we want to address their concern over copyright infringement. So this is where the training comes in. Possible negative impact on reputation, lack of feedback, and, and so on. Um, these are some more, uh, con there's a lot of concern it seems. <laughs> Two slides on concerns alone, okay? 
But these are real. And these are the things that I think we need to uh, take into account when we are discussing about this part, especially in our policy. Okay. okay. Can, can, can we just, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, in our e-learning policy, this is our target. By 2020, so we are now 2019, so we should be here in terms of our original content, 25% of all courses offered, right, have original, oh, I get two papers already, have original e-content. So whether we have achieved this or not, I'm not very sure. Um, so way forward. Now, in order to really uh, realize the uh, the OER implementation in in the you know in a big way in in our uh, university and and even school, I think we need to have a clear sense of purpose at all levels. So I think to make this happen, this is where we need to you know the Ministry of Education need to play a role to champion this. So. I would say that just like our MOOC, where 20 public universities really involved and moved together, that is because the champion was from the minister himself. So I think we need the same uh, approach here, a clear sense of purpose at all levels, and then um, it must be driven by a national framework on flexible education. So we look at the whole ecosystem and enablers of flexible education, and the OER should be part of that. So the national policy that we are, we are working on should be part of the bigger policy or framework of the flexible education. Okay? And the third one, I think, this, uh, the, our Philippine uh, friend just now mentioned that uh, most universities have their own OER repository, but how do we pull them together and we can create a so-called national hub for institutional uh, repository uh, this is an example of what we have in USM, our own repository of OER. UMS also have a very good one. And what about the content development itself? Do we have so-called a common standard, or I, I, I use a US one, like core common standard to develop the content? A very essential one. But of course, we leave some room for creativity. But the common core standards are there to be followed so that we reach, uh, we have a minimum standard for all the OER. Then, of course, the question about how do we design OER purposefully in achieving meaningful and impactful learning for everyone, meaning the inclusive, the, uh, the, inclu the OER that uh, you know, uh, we want to, we are doing today. And finally, um, essential enablers to support the development and application of OER. The slide where we have so many things, you know, the, the, the enabling factors to support OER, these are the things that we need to uh, put in also in our policy. Maybe not everything, in, because what the policy we're going to have is basically the policy statement, but the next level will be maybe the policy guidelines uh, and, and so on, the more detailed uh, implementation plan or the playbook, just like uh, what we have for Malaysia Education Blueprint. So basically, that's about all. Thank you uh, very much. Hopefully, you get some yeah, idea from this. Thank you.